Modern wireline transceivers are complete digital modems with dozens of parameters that need to be optimized and adjusted. The interactions between all these parameters are subtle, complex, and yet often critical. Significant performance benefits are available if you're able to properly co-optimize these. ADC resolution, equalization complexity in the receiver, and the equalizer tap weights can all be co-optimized to minimize power for a given channel, as shown in this publication here, where a greedy search algorithm is used to dynamically select the correct number of bits required in the A to D and in the equalization circuitry. There are a lot of parameters in the analog front end of receivers that control things like termination and CTLE knobs. Uh, these parameters all interact and affect the overall analog front end response and thereby the efficacy of the analog equalization. So these can be co-optimized to great effect. And an example is in this paper here, where a genetic optimizer runs on an embedded processor to select the best out of over 10 million analog front end settings. Forward error correction is increasingly relied on to correct the few errors that arise in wireline links. And we usually rely on these under what we call the FEC error paradigm. That is, for a particular code, we might assume a, that a prefected error rate of 10 to the minus 4 can be corrected by the error control code to provide a post-vected error rate of, say, 10 to the minus 15. But the truth is that's not necessarily true. The amount of error correction that the code provides depends on the patterns of errors that arise in the underlying link. So in this paper, we look at um, what choices can be made in the optimization of the equalizer circuits, the AFE, transmit equalizer, and receive equalizer that cause bit errors that do arise to arise only in patterns that are correctable by the particular type of code that's used. Genetic optimizer is used for design space exploration of alternatives. Now let's look a little bit more at the trouble with particular error patterns, specifically bursts of consecutive errors. Forward error control codes and wireline links are typically block codes that can correct a fixed maximum number of bit or symbol errors within each block of bits. So let's consider a simple toy example. Real wireline forward error control codes are much more complex than this. But let's, for the purpose of illustration, let's assume that the FEC can correct a maximum of one bit error in each block of five bits. And let's say we have an originally transmitted sequence of alternating ones and zeros. Now let's say the receiver uh, has one of these two possible error patterns. In the top case, two bit errors are spread over 20 consecutive bits in such a way that they land in different blocks. Now, in this case, the both errors are totally correctable because there's only one bit error in each block of five bits. On the other hand, if we have some bad luck and both those bit errors happen to land in the same block of five bits, the pattern becomes uncorrectable. And we will therefore, although we have the same average prefect bit error rate in both cases, we will have very different postfect bit error rates. The fact is some error patterns are correctable, some are not. So for a particular code, it's possible that there's a good bit error rate of 10 to the minus four and a bad bit error rate of 10 to the minus four, depending on the pattern of errors, which in turn depends on the underlying transceiver architectural choices. It's therefore possible to co-optimize the transmitter and receiver circuits based on a number of different criteria. One of the most common choices is to optimize the equalization in the transceiver to maximize the signal to noise ratio just before symbol decisions are made. This is the criteria implicitly used whenever LMS adaptation is used in determining the tap weights of equalizers, for example. Another possibility that's sometimes used for some calibration in wireline transceivers to look at the prefect bit error rate. That is to compare the output of the decision circuit here to the actually transmitted sequences by some prearrangement of a known uh, training pattern or something like that, and to thereby um, adjust their receiver parameters accordingly. But really the best case would be to look at the post-fect bit error rate since that's what we really care about. 
Here we see a heat map of the post fact bit error rate for a channel with 30 dB loss and 2.4 millivolts input referred receiver noise versus the two DFE tap weights. And we see that the cool blue represents the lowest post fact bit error rate choice of DFE tap weights. And we have labeled on here the combination of tap weights that provides the lowest prefect bit error rate. We see that they're very different tap weights that achieve the best prefect bit error rate and post fact bit error rate. Moreover, if we chose the DFE coefficients that gave rise to the lowest prefect bit error rate, we would have very suboptimal post fact bit error rate. And you can see that the performance surface changes depending on whether we assume different types of coding for the link. Here we're considering the optimization of CTLE passive component values in order to minimize prefect bit error rate in this case for a 35 dB loss channel at 112 gigabits per second. And what we notice here is another interesting phenomenon, which is that even if you were to use a conventional gradient descent type method to try to minimize bit error rate, what might happen is that you can get trapped in a local minima. So for example, if you have an initial condition somewhere over here and you adapted the equalizer parameters to minimize bit error rate, that would suggest that you should arrive at this combination of capacitor values. Whereas really a lower bit error rate were, is available to you over here, but you might never explore that part of the performance surface unless you use a very sophisticated global optimization engine to do the optimization. This so-called non-unimodal performance surface will arise in general when adapting both the poles and the zeros of uh, components in the signal path. Subtle interactions arise between digital equalization and timing recovery loops in DSP receivers. The common Mueller-Mueller phase detection operates by correlating neighboring samples of the received waveform to determine whether to advance or delay the sampling phase of the receiver. Whereas the receiver's error is minimized by selecting the equalizer tap weights over here to minimize ISI, timing recovery actually performs the best when the slope of the equalized channel pulse response is high, specifically at the first pre and post cursors. So these are slightly different criteria for optimizing the equalizer in the timing recovery loop and in the data recovery path. Note that part of the equalization is implicated in both paths. So it's pretty difficult to say precisely how it should all be optimized. Latency in the timing recovery path introduced, for example, by digital equalization there, impacts the stability of the timing feedback loop. If equalization complexity in that path and thus latency increases, the timing recovery loop bandwidth has to be reduced to maintain a constant phase margin around that loop. So there's many subtle interactions between equalization and timing recovery performance that become increasingly significant at higher data rates and tighter jitter budgets.